Oh, Taz Akram, would you pray for us tonight? Uh, well, uh, you want in English or Arabic, Abuna? Whatever you prefer, whatever is, uh, is easier for you. Oh, okay. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. We thank you that you are collecting us for to pray for you. Jesus, you said, if two or three gathered under my name, I will be with them. We are sure, we believe that you are with us. Uh, Jesus, we love you. We ask for your uh, blessing. Bless everybody uh, with us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Through the intercession of St. Mary and all your saints and mothers who please you from the beginning. By the power of your holy cross, please the Lord make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All righty, let me do this real quick. Okay. Okay. All righty. So let's go ahead and just do a quick review. Last week we. Uh, covered Isaiah chapter 10. I'll just go over some quick highlights from what we talked about. Please, at any time, feel free to jump in, add any comments or questions or anything. Um, we started out the chapter by, by seeing how sooner or later God's justice will be served, um, which is like a a double-edged thing. It's a, a great comfort for those who are oppressed and those who are suffering and those who are in pain and those who see injustice. And at the same time, it's, it's a definite clear warning for the oppressors, for those who are doing the injustice, for those who are um, not living life according to his will. Um, and then we, we how God hates evil, period, whether it's done by believers or non-believers. He doesn't like uh, harm, injustice, wickedness, all kinds of um, ugliness. He, he doesn't like those things. Um, and we saw how even without the law, the men will be judged, without, the men without the law will be judged according to the natural law. Just like how he, the Assyrians weren't God's people and they didn't receive his commandments, but they were judged according to the natural law, according to the natural law that he put in our hearts. We know not to kill each other. We know not to steal. We know not to rape. We know not to throw our babies in the fire. Um, and so even those who didn't receive God's word will be judged according to the natural, as he told us uh, somewhere else in the Bible. Um, also, we saw how our acts of kindness and love and charity that are done in the name of the Lord, not to make myself, you know, appear whatever, uh, they will be our allies on judgment day. Um, they go ahead of us and they'll be our allies and our defenders on judgment day. And then we saw how with God, nothing is impossible. And without God, we can do nothing. Uh, it's a very interesting contrast. There's no in between. And then we saw that lovely verse, but his hand is stretched out still. Uh, how God always gives hope. This was like a continuation of what he was saying in chapter 9 to the people of Israel. And then from verse 5 on, he, he stood the focus onto the people of uh, Assyria. Um, how he called Assyria, the yeah, he said woe to them, but they were the rod of his anger and the staff in whose hand is, is his indignation. So um, even though um, and he got, God is using them 
to discipline their, his rebellious children. The Assyrians were a tool in his hands. Uh, he said, woe to them, and we saw the answer for that in verse 7, um, because he says, yet he did not mean so, nor does he, his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off a new, uh, not a few nations. Is that the Assyrians, even though God was using their selfishness and wickedness and greed to discipline the Israelites, the Assyrians also receive a woe because, you know, they wanted to destroy cut off uh, a lot of nations and to take their spoils. Um, and and we saw what was it really that God didn't like about the Assyrians um, or how they were living their life, which was their heart. And we saw that in their arrogance in, in verse 13 and 14. Um, how it says for Assyrian, for by my hand, I have done it by my wisdom. I am prudent. Um, I have removed the boundaries of the people. I have robbed their treasuries. I have put down the inhabitants etc. My hand has found like a nest the riches, the nest that has been left, I have gathered, etc. So, and, and it reminded us of um, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, how he thought the same thing and God didn't like that at all because our, our biggest enemy, I think, is pride and arrogance. Um, and God humbled him in order to win him back and to bring him back to him. And we basically concluded from this how God will humble the arrogant for their own good and for their own salvation. And we quoted Sirach uh, 320, or in some translations, it's 319. He it says what? The greater you are, the more you must humble yourself so you will find favor in the sight of God. So whatever talents or strengths or gifts God has bestowed upon us, money, position, possession, education, influence, authority, or whatever, remember that God gave it to you for a reason, for a purpose, and ultimately, while the methods may differ, the ultimate goal is the expansion of his kingdom by saving as many souls as possible through you with the gift and privileges that he gave you. He gave you. By all means, do not. You know, be careful not to let it go to your head, lest God forbid you end up learning the same, hearing the same words and the same judgment that God has given the Assyrians here. Remember that all that you have and all that you are was given to you by God for a purpose. And don't think that you made all that stuff happen for yourself so that God doesn't really be forced to have to humble you. Um, yeah, we said... Feel good about your talents. By all means, don't say I'm bad, I'm whatever, but give the credit to God who gave them to you. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, we talked about how he is the anointed one who by the rod of the cross will break our yoke of bondage and set us free. And then the last thing we got to was how um, those who see how God disciplines the carnal nations uh, or those live in rebellion to him will learn to rely only on him and not on, on those carnal nations or those who are live, living carnal lives. Um, that's kind of a, a quick summary of that chapter just in a nutshell. Does anybody have any comments or questions about it? Or are you ready to go to chapter 11? Ready for chapter eleven. All righty. Um, you know what's funny when I when I read chapter eleven, I thought, okay, it's, you know, kind of short, sixteen verses. Um, but then as I was going through it, I kept finding more and more and more stuff. So I don't even know if we will finish it, but let's uh, let's go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll see how far we go. We we may finish it actually. Um, and actually, I didn't know where to break it up so i just need somebody to read the whole chapter from verse 1 through 16. um let's see kathy you haven't read for us in a while let's have kathy read it from verse 1 through all the way through 16. okay i'm gonna close my door real quick okay 
Um, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pothros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim but they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria, as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. Thank you. All righty. Um, let's go back to the top. Okay, so let me remind you what chapter 10 ended up with. If you recall it, it ended up with God... Um, kind of declaring his punishment or his chastisement to those people, right? He says things like he will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. He will lop off the bow with terror. Uh, those of high stature will be hewn down and the holy will be humble. He will cut down the thicket of the forest with iron and the Lebanon will fall by the mighty one, all that stuff, okay? And then as we've seen many times in Isaiah, so far, and I think we'll continue to see this, where he quickly comes in with his encouragement and the good news of his message of salvation. He always adds hope to chastisement. He adds consolation and comfort to judgment. Um, and we see that now here in chapter 11. Uh, it's a really a, a great chapter. What's interesting is that that common dichotomous contrast, if you will, that we often see in the Bible. Assyria, the thick and mighty forest full of giant trees like the cedars of Lebanon, what happened to it? It got cut down to the point where, remember, a little child can count the trees, the few trees that are left on his hands. And the salvation of mankind altogether will occur by what? We see that in, in the first uh, verse. By a single branch. You see what happened? The whole forest, the mighty forest, was cut down, and then a single branch will, will do this. It says in verse 1, 
There shall forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Notice that rod, well, yeah, it says it here in the Coptic reader. Rod and branch are capital letters. And that's, you know, a clue. Now, from the stem of Jesse, uh, a rod grown from the stem of Jesse, what is that talking about? Jesse is who? The father of David. King David. Correct. So this is the, the ancestry of the Lord, okay, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what about the branch? Now remember, branch means what, or like what word means branch? Where he's from? The little town. Yeah. Nazareth. Nazareth, that's right. Nazareth means uh, branch. Um, so the branch, you know, but, you know, it says something kind of interesting. The branch shall grow out of his roots. Did anybody study horticulture? Where do branches grow out of? <laughs> the, the trunk, right? The vine. So typically branches come out of the trunk or the vine. Um, as in the first part, you know, the, the stem uh, or the rod out of the stem of, of Jesse. So that makes sense. But why do you think he said the branch from the roots? What do you think he means here uh, by this? He's there from eternity. Right on. So one, one thought is that could be referring way back to the tribe of Judah, basically when, when that whole tribe began from the roots of it. But I, I am more like what Dr. Philip said, it's referring to what God told the serpent at the garden about the seed of Eve in Genesis 3.15. And he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Sometimes we forget that God knew everything before all creation. God had the plan of salvation in his mind before all creation and even before the fall. And our Lord Jesus Christ is that branch, happy branch, that is stemming from way, way back from the very, very deepest roots of Jesse. Um, Remember when they were questioning the Lord and trying to entrap him and, and get him to say something wrong so they can get him in trouble or find something to accuse him with? And then he said, okay, I'll ask you a question. And what did he ask them? What does it mean when it says, the Lord said to my Lord? So is he the, uh, the root of David or the descendant of David? And they had no answer. right? And then they quit uh, bothering him after that with questions because they figured out they can't, they can't get him. So this is kind of what he's talking about here. Um, so he's a descendant of Jesse or of David, but he's also a branch that has grown from way, way from the deepest of roots. Um, then in verse two, again, y'all fear to stop me if you have any questions or comments. Verse two says, the spirit of the Lord, pay attention to this verse. We're going to spend some time in it. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. How many um, attributes is this verse talking about? How many attributes of the spirit of God is it telling us? Any guess? Pick a number. You don't even right. have to count because we're talking about the spirit of the Lord and God is perfect. So right away we should know. Seven. Seven. Yes. Um, so these are seven attributes. And, and actually, if you recall, um, we read about this in, in Revelation. I believe someone I was asking about this a few um, Bible studies ago, or I don't remember, in one of the meetings we were at about the seven spirits of God. Okay, and here they are. So the first thing is that it is the spirit of, no, sorry, sorry, I apologize. Not it. He is the spirit of the Lord. 
He is God's spirit. This is the first one. He sanctifies. As we read in, in um, we read earlier in chapter 10, uh, verse 17, last week, he is the light and the fire. He uh, pierces the deepest darkness. He purges, he cleanses, he measures everything. He examines us, he weighs us, um, and he fills all. So this is the, the, the spirit of God. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Number three, the spirit of understanding. Now, when you look at wisdom and understanding, these are what kind of attributes? They're like mental attributes, right? Intellectual attributes. Um, and right away, we actually see this kind of jiving with in John 14, 26, where we read this in the gospel of the third hour, where he says, uh, but the helper or the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, eh, he will do what? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things. So <clears throat> he will, he's the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding. Okay. Then after that, it says he's the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might. So counsel and might have to do with practical or applicable attributes. I don't want to mean like the other ones aren't practical, but like applicable attributes, things to do. It is not enough to just not understand, but also to apply the wisdom in counsel and might in how I live my life. The spirit of counsel guides him and the spirit of might gives him the courage and the strength to take action and to endure. Okay. Or not him, us. Okay. Um, the spirit of counsel, he guides us and the spirit of might gives us the, the courage and the strength to actually take action and to, to, to endure and to actually do it. And then it says the spirit, this is the last two, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Knowledge and the fear of the Lord have to do with spiritual attributes. So after we said he's the spirit of God, then we talked about like mental, intellectual attributes. Then we talked about applicable, like action attributes. And then the last two are about spiritual attributes. Because to live a true spiritual life, I need to know the good knowledge. And in order to actually live it, in a, in a world that is increasingly carnal, I need the spirit of the fear of the Lord in my heart um, so that I'm able to apply this good, godly knowledge in my life. Um, and here's the cool part, y'all. At the epiphany or the theophany, um, by the way, do you know what the difference between epiphany and, and theophany is? First of all, do you know what talk what day I'm talking about? We call it what? It's like the baptism yeah. of the Lord, right? And so what is the difference between epiphany and theophany? The appearance, the appearance of the Holy Spirit for the Lord when, when the, um, uh, they call the... the The, yeah, the appearance, the appearance, something appearance. There. Yes. Zuhr yeah. Yes. So that's theophany. So, so epiphany means revelation. Okay. I've ever heard somebody say, I got an epiphany. Um, it means revelation. So it's, there's something that's been revealed. The truth, the, the Holy Trinity has been revealed. Then theophany, theo is like God. So the theophany means the appearance of God because we've got to be able to see the, the, and hear the Holy Trinity. So at the epiphany or the theophany, at the baptism of the Lord, when the Holy Spirit then rested upon him, this occurred not for him because God the Son has been in perfect communion with God the Holy Spirit since eternity, right? So why did this happen? For whose sake? This actually occurred for our sake, for our benefit, because 
by his incarnation and taking flesh and taking a body like us, he carried us in him, right? Because and, and when he bore the cross on his shoulders, he bore us on his shoulder and our deeds on his shoulder. And when he died on the cross, he bore all our sins for all of humanity on himself. So this occurred for us because now by his by what he accomplished, remember he said it is accomplished, it is finished. By what he accomplished, the Holy Spirit with those amazing seven attributes, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, um, came and it can come. And now it can come and rest also uh, on those or in those who believe and are baptized. Isn't that just awesome? It's really awesome news for us. Um, and right away, I think this, this makes me think that these are the things we should pray for, y'all. Okay? These are the things we should measure ourselves in, examine ourselves in and gauge our growth in, okay? Um, it's very easy for a person to say, well, you know, five years ago I was making, so my salary was so much, and today my salary is so much, and they can gauge and see. And anybody, you can ask them, how are you doing financially, you know, today compared to so many years ago? They can answer you right away. But when you ask somebody about, like, spiritually, you know, how are you doing and stuff like that, they go, hmm. Uh, well, let's see. I don't know. Um, and that's not good. We need to, we need to know, okay? Um, these are the things that we need to focus on. These are the things we need to pray about and ask for. These are the things we need to gauge ourselves in and to gauge our growth in. Because when we do that, then right away we know if we are being transformed more and more into being Christ-like or not. And this is what we need to be. So I should check myself and, and ask myself, is the Spirit of the Lord able to rest on me? Or am I regularly grieving Him? Or regularly going to places or participating in things or speaking in certain ways? that he's not able to rest at. Um, one of the things, and um, this is not like church fathers or anything, I'm just giving you my, my own personal opinion. So I, I don't know, I hope I'm not blaspheming. I don't know if this the, theologically correct or not. So you know how after the creation, the Lord rested? Uh, now, this means two things. First of all, a lot of people erroneously think that God stopped working, which is bogus, of course, because the Lord has been working. Like he said, I must be working as my Father in heaven is working. He just rested. He stopped from the work of creation. There's nothing else to create. He created everything to be created. Okay? We were the pinnacle of that creation. But I, I think the word, and, and I was reading this, uh, I, I like to compare different translations in the Bible. And the word rests here. You know, when you say a body is in motion or a body is at rest, you know, in Arabic actually is a uh, stekan or second, which means he resided. Like a person rests in his home. And, I, and I'd like to think that after creating mankind that now in his own image and likeness, now God can, can find a place in his creation where he can rest, where he can dwell, which is man's heart. Um, so this is a question for me to ask myself, is, is my heart a place where the spirit of the Lord can rest in? Okay, can, remember we, we compared him to, you know, like a calm, gentle, shy dove, if you will, like the Holy Spirit, where, where do I make my heart a, a, a clean, calm place of, where he can come and rest, or is it full of turmoil inside and, and bad thoughts and ugliness? Um, excuse me one second.
sorry. Um, second, the number two is, am I seeking and growing in wisdom and understanding? And number three, am I increasingly getting my counsel from the church, from God's word, from the church fathers, from my father of confession, or am I an arrogant vigilante, not accepting counsel from anybody? Am I wise in my own eyes? Number four, am I intellectually and diligently working on growing in good kind of knowledge and in the fear of the Lord? We're, we're, we hope for those things to happen, mind you. I know and I believe that all of you here in this meeting, you hope for those things to happen. But am I intentionally like trying to work on these things, to grow in these things? Then in verse 3, it says, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. Does this sound familiar to anybody? His delight is in the fear of the Lord. It's from a psalm, right? Very good. Psalm 1. You know, blessed is the man who has not walked in the council of the godly, has not stood in the way of sinners, and has not sat in the seat of even men. His delight is in the law of the Lord. It says law of the Lord as opposed to in the fear of the Lord, but it's, it's the same thing. Also, one of the cool things, Psalm 22, in verse 8, you know, Psalm 22 that starts with, oh my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 8, it says, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. So, who is this talking about? Again, that branch, okay, our Lord Jesus Christ. There comes a time in a person's spiritual journey where he or she delights in the fear of the Lord. Okay, When a person delights in obeying God and in living according to God's will, the person delights when they see other people living in the fear of the Lord and living according to his will. It just makes him or her like so, so happy. It, it, I don't know how to explain it, but there's a time in, in each one of us in our lives where like, I don't know, the things that they used to, they have like a shift or a change. And what are the things that they used to seek? Or what are the things that you used to really enjoy or delight in? Um, and hopefully that's a sign of, you know, growth and maturity. And look at the rest of verse three. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Remember how we often talk about not focusing so much on the seen, but rather on the unseen, and to be able to look at the inside of a person, to consider what's going on inside a person's heart that is causing them to like behave a certain way. Um, a person, I'll call it with, with low maturity or low spirituality, is quick to judge by what they see and what they hear on the surface. But not him, not capital H him. See what it says in, as it continues on in, in verse 4? It says, he doesn't just uh, by the sight, doesn't judge by the sight of the eyes and the hearing of the uh, Ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Man is, and I see so much of this lately, but man is very quick to judge a book by its cover. We can quickly look at a person and judge by, you know, judge them by how how they dress or what they drive and. If this person looks nice, dresses nice, maybe drives a nice car, uh, we are more quick to uh, readily accept this person or to respect this person. Um, but if we want, you know, we if we see a person who was the opposite, um, we are less likely to readily accept them or respect them. Um, but if if we really want to be Christ-like. We need to behave like him and see, as he said, uh, 
uh, we look at how people behave, speak, walk, and talk, etc., and we judge them and value them based on that. But what does he see? This is what we see. What he sees, he sees someone made in his image and according to his likeness, someone, a soul that he purchased with his blood, um, and a soul that needs salvation. It would be really great to see people and actually to see myself with God's eyes. Um, there's lots of verses that remind us of this. First Samuel 16, 7. Remember when, when Samuel went to pick the king for Israel after Saul and he went to Jesse's house and he was about to pick Abinadab because he was like a football player, tall and big and all that stuff. And in 1 Samuel 16, 7, they told him, no, 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 he's not the one. He said, the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, at the heart. And um, 1 Thessalonians, second, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says, God examines our heart. Um, also, St. Paul remind us, reminded us of this. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, he says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Think about it this way. I want you to look around you. Look at look out your window, look in the room around you, look at people around you. Everything you see will come to an end and will like dissipate. The things that really will last, the things that really matter are the things that actually you can't see with your own eyes. You have to close your eyes to see them, if you will. So, and also more importantly to this, let's reverse that, okay? I may appear externally to people as wise and kind and pleasant and humble, um, but it all may be an act, a mask, okay? But I need to remember, God knows my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, my perceptions, my interpretations. He sees the heart. He knows and sees exactly what's going on in my heart. He sees the real me. We, we really forget that fact sometimes. And I think, I don't know, because we don't, we don't look at it, so it's like as if it's not there. I remember when the kids were little, Sometimes if we're playing hide and seek, all they would do is just sit there in the same room, but they would cover their own eyes <laughs> as if they're hiding. Uh, but we do that with God, like, you know, because I think, okay, I'm not going to look at it, so therefore God is not going to see it. But if, if, we, if I'm ever mindful that God is right now, this one that I just thought about right now, he sees that. And I would be like, you know, ashamed from it, embarrassed from it. I would try to tweak it. I would try to hone it in and bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ if I am mindful of this. Um, and also, I wouldn't be so, like, happy because I was able to fool people or, or, or able to get them to see the outside. Um, ideally, ideally, is if we work on this so much that we make our inside and outside match and let people see that. Oh, how comfortable and relaxed is that person? Um, okay, and then he says, "What well, with righteousness he shall judge the poor." By the way, judge here is not like condemn. It's like it's almost like with righteousness he shall judge for the poor. Okay. Um, and the first thing that our Lord Jesus Christ declared in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 3 has to do with the poor. He said what to them? Blessed are what? Sermon on the you, Mount. You mean the poor in spirit? Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then, so it says, with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Then again, this, that, that blessed are the poor was Matthew 5, 3. Matthew 5, 5 is blessed are the meek 
for they shall inherit the earth. Inherit the kingdom. Kind of nice to, to connect kind of different parts in the Bible together and to see how it's all painting the same pictures, like pieces of the same jigsaw puzzle fitting together. Now, the allegory in the second half of verse four is just, it's, it's, it's pretty deep. It's pretty high. Okay. Look at this. It says, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. What, what's all that about? Any thoughts? You're muted, Mom. The word of God is word. Yes. Uh, okay. So look at all this, like all the stuff together. So strike. Strikes the earth with the rod. First of all, we saw the striking with the rod at a certain point in the Old Testament, okay? Which is when Moses, when God told Moses to strike the rock with the rod in Exodus, and that rock gushed all the water for the people to drink. And at the time of crucifixion, while the rock, our Lord Jesus Christ, was struck or speared with the, with the spear, but at the same time, the cross, if you think about it, or if you saw them doing it, what did they do? They planted it in the earth itself. Um, and the earth shook and quaked and the rock split and so on. So that's the striking the earth with the rod part. Now it says, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. So after the fall, of Adam and Eve, God passed judgment on the earth with his mouth, okay, with his word. And the word of God is John 1, our Lord Jesus Christ. So he passed the judgment on the earth with the rod of his mouth, okay. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Then the third, it says, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Wicked here, um, you can see it, it's, it's a little bit clearer. <clears throat> okay, wicked can mean a bunch of things in English, right? And I think depending on who you're talking to, wicked, it could, it could be a good thing. <laughs> That's wicked, right? Um, but in Arabic here, it's a lot clearer. I don't know if you can see the mouse that I'm moving. Can you all see that mouse on the screen? Okay, so the wicked here is al munafiq what does al munafiq mean? Munafiq means two-faced hypocrite, the liar, the deceiver. And we know who the liar and the father of lies is, right? And those who are his children, remember the Lord told them, you're not the children of Abraham. If you were, you would do like him. You are the children of the devil because you are, you are doing like him. You are lying hypocrites, okay? Um, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of the end of times uh, when our Lord Jesus Christ passed the judgment from his mouth and by his word, he shall slay the wicked. Um, we all know how he feels about yani, hypocrisy and about believing one thing and behaving or appearing in another way that is different. He does not like that at all. It's very dangerous for us, his children. Okay, let's go on. So in verse five, it says what? Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness shall be the belt of his waist. Okay. Right away, what does this remind you of? The belt. The full armor of God. Yes, exactly. In Ephesians six, the armor of God. Um, and when you pay attention to the commandments in the Bible, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you will find that our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled them all, all of them, okay? Um, the word, the armor of God, um, 
anything and everything that our Lord Jesus Christ did is stemming from righteousness and faithfulness. And, and it focuses here on the loin or the waist because that's where the core of the body is. That's where the is like the, the, not just the intentions, but like the actions, the, the will manifested in action. Okay. It's moved by righteousness and faithfulness. And then we go to verses uh, six through eight, which is pretty interesting. I'm going to read it for y'all. It says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie, shall lie down with the young goat, the calf with the young lion, the fatling and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child put his hand in the viper's den. Um, <laughs> well, let me ask you first before I say this. Come closer to your microphone. Say that again. Mama, what did you say? Can I go back to five? Can you go Verse back to five? five? Yes, harder. What's the difference between uh, right, righteousness for the loins and faithfulness for the waist? What's the difference between the two? It is one thing. Um, no, I think it's just reiterating. I don't. I don't think that there is a difference. I think it's reiterating, like, um, yeah, reiterating, like reinforcing. Is that basically his loins and his waist, he moves out and acts out of righteousness and faithfulness. It's not a difference. It's just basically reiterating or, or confirming. Okay, let's look at verses six to eight about animals living together. What do you think that's talking about? Changing the, the change of the vicious and evil nature of man after the salvation of God, maybe. Okay. Okay, you're on to depth or the punchline right there. I'll tell you something funny. I was reading um, in a book recently. It's not a yani, uh, church father's book. It's just like a recent book, an American book. And the author was claiming that pets will be saved and will be heaven. And he was talking about how, you know, the lion and the lame, you know, they'll be laying together and all that stuff. Um, and of course, we don't we don't believe in that um, because our Lord. Get, yes. The the voice is uh, interrupted. So oh, I'm sorry. Um, is anybody else having problem hearing me, or is it coming through okay? You're okay. Okay. Here. okay. I think it's okay. I'll, so I'll say it again. I was saying, I, um, I was reading in a book where somebody was claiming, like to use such verses like the lion and the lamb laying together to talk about how he believes that, you know, his pet dog that died um, will be in heaven. But of course, we don't believe that, okay? Because our Lord Jesus Christ died only for those who were made in his image and according to his likeness. Okay, so I just want to put that out there. Um, but this is not to say, Yanni, that there won't be animals or creatures in heaven. I don't know. Um, he did it in paradise, in the Garden of Eden. There were uh, animals there. Um, but uh, I don't know. But the main point here, okay, which is actually what Rafat was alluding to, is that he will restore all peace and harmony back to how it was before the fall. 
back to how it was intended to be. He will restore the peace and the harmony and the love, and he will restore all things. Okay, And not only that, but those who live the kingdom life with God now on earth, the more they truly walk with God, the more the flesh and the spirit, who used to be like mortal enemies, right? The more they are better able to live at peace and harmony together. This is the person who, uh, who believes in God and is baptized and has the spirit with all these seven attributes. And as they walk with God and grow with God and, and let the spirit cleanse them and, try, and, and, and purge them and purify them and they grow and walk with God, those two mortal enemies, the spirit and the flesh, begin to be able to be to live in more and more peace. And it's never going to be a perfect situation, right? Because, like, as the Bible tells us, they're always combating each other. But the more a person grows, the more they're able to control their flesh and buffet their body and bring it to subjection and and have the two mortal enemies, the spirit and the flesh, live in peace and harmony together, to abide and to cohabitate together. It is not that the, the spirit dreads no more like that. The spirit dreads the flesh and the flesh hates the spirit or the things of the spirit. This occurs more and more as we let God reign in our hearts and rule in our hearts and to cohabitate with each other, if you will, in purity and in selflessness. Um, and you see, and you see people like, um, how those who are more and more walking with God, you can see people like of different genders, like being in the same place together, but in purity, and they don't think any thoughts. People of different races, or different socioeconomic status, um, maybe they've been enemies before, they can able, they're better able to live together in oneness and in peace and in equality. Uh, Habib, go ahead. Could it be also as a result of surrendering to God and let him control everything that takes us back to Noah's Ark because inside the Ark, there is no separate room for the lion and the ox and so on. But all those animals I get directed to go inside by the power of God. So he, in the essence, at the time they, they surrender their vicious character to the Lord. So they, when, when, when this happened, the Lord will reign and everybody surrender. So then the, even the nature of the animal will be changed. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, I don't know if during that time, God just, you know, obviously God was involved in this whole thing and, and he's able to, he's not going to control the free will of man, but he's able to control the animals and get them to do his will. And we see a lot of examples of that, right? Like, um, who was it, Jeremiah, where these, uh, the young people, we're calling him uh, Baldy or something like that. And then a, a bear came out and, and attacked them. Or the fish, you know, you know the fishermen have, have been fishing all day and they caught nothing. So there's no fish around. But it told them, no, no go out and, and cast into the deep or cast the net onto the right side of the boat. And, and he orders the fish to come and let themselves be caught in the net, if you will or the great fish or the whale that swallowed Jonah. So we see actually, <laughs> it'd be great if we behaved like animals, if it makes any sense, but in the sense of like obeying God like that, uh, even to the point of death. And then he says in that same um, section, verse eight, the, the nursing child shall play with the cobra's hole, by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Those who walk with God, even though they may be as simple and as pure and as innocent and harmless as a nursing child, because they have God's wisdom, they will be able to cohabitate with the most cunning of all people. Um, the bottom line is, is that you can, you can sense it. I, and I'm sure some of you have met people like that, but you can sense it when you are in the presence of someone who is walking with God and has been walking with God and, and is able to get their body or flesh to align with their spirit in the obedience of God. And you feel the immense peace that they're in and rest that they're in. And actually, it, like, 
you can feel that peace and rest when you're in their presence. Did anybody feel any, anything like that with, with anybody? Have you met people like that? You can just sense it. Um, to verse 10. In that day, remember those words. Remember, we hear there a lot in Isaiah. In that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. There's that, that root of Jesse again. Or that, that is also the branch of Jesse. Who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him. The Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. Um, he shall stand as a banner to the people. Do you, have, do you recall where else we read um, the Lord being called a banner? There are several times uh, in the in the Old Testament with uh, with Moses and uh, yes. and Joshua. Exactly, that's that's the one I'm looking for. Jehovah, you know what the word is for banner? Jehovah Nisi. That's the Lord is banner. When when they were in the battle with the Amalekite, and um, when Moses would spread his arms and pray in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and the shape of a cross, they won the war. And then he called that place what Jehovah Nisi, or the Lord is my banner. Um, let's talk a little bit about the banner because a banner is not just any flag, okay? Um, usually banner is referred to in wars, in battles. And while every soldier is fighting, they would all keep an eye out for that banner. And they would follow that banner. When the banner goes a little to the east, they go to the east. If it says let's move to the north, then they follow it to the north. Um, so that's the first thing we know about banners. And then the other thing is, as long as that banner is lifted up, we're okay. As long as that banner is lifted up, we're doing fine. Okay, the, the war is ongoing. We didn't lose yet. And there's more. How was the banner hanging? On what? <laughs> I'm being a little literal here. Um, on the rod, on the wood, up high for all to see. The Lord is my banner on the wood of the cross. And once that banner is planted in the enemy's territory, this is the Lord on the cross on the earth. Okay? Once the banner is planted in the enemy's territory, we won the war. It is finished. It is accomplished. Um, and the road of Jesse shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him. The Gentiles are the ones who are seeking him. It is not just exclusive for the Jews anymore. Okay. Um, and look at the rest of verse 10. It says, and his resting place shall be glorious. And his resting place shall be glorious. Remember what he said in um, Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I feel like there's a theme of rest going on throughout this whole chapter. Um, and it says, and his resting place shall be glorious. It's not just rest, it is glorious rest. This reminds me of 1 Corinthians 2, 9, where it says, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered the, into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So, and I, I love this, this, this glorious resting place to a certain degree. We can tap into that right now while we're still on earth. Remember we said the kingdom life is available. We can walk with God right now. We don't have to wait till we die and go to paradise to experience it. But to a certain degree, obviously not to the fullest degree, we can begin to experience that. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. And you see such people. They have really a lot of rest and a lot of peace. Verse 11 is again, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set 
his hand against the sec again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. So as we studied in the in the beginning of the book, um, how the prophecies mentioned here, they can be talking about the near future, they can be talking about at the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, and, and they can be talking about after the second coming, okay, in eternity. Um, they are multifaceted time-wise, if you will. So our Lord Jesus Christ came and recovered the remnant from the captivity to bring them back to Israel. Okay, he already did that. And, and we saw that, and we read in the Bible how the remnant went back. Okay, and he will come and recover the remnant who accept him and believe in him during his incarnation. And we also saw a lot of that how many of the, the Jews believed and walked with him. And he comes and recovers the remnant who are in captivity at Hades, in Hades. Do you all recall when we, when we uh, St. Peter tells us this in 1 Peter 3.19, 3, 18 and 19. Do you remember that part where it says, this can be a little bit confusing, but these are people who, who died without knowing the Lord who died without having been baptized, who died without anything, okay? But to all of these people, when they die, they go to Hades. Even those who die now after the crucifixion, time was. But again, just remember, once we go into the spiritual realm, it's not time constricted. But 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, for the just, I'm sorry, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. What is this to the spirits in prison? That's those people who are in Hades. Again, the remnant. So this is yet one more level of the fulfillment of the prophecy, where again, the second time he comes and recovers the remnant of the people from the left and from the right, from everywhere, from all over. And those who died and were in Hades, but they were trapped in Hades, who had their heart directed towards him and would have believed him had they met him, had they known him, had they seen the truth, etc. When they hear him preach to them, to the spirits in prison, they will follow him out of Hades. Will followed him, have followed him, we're not going to put tense on the verses when it comes to that. And then the last few verses, uh, simply talking about how we'll reunite Israel with Judah, even though Israel was attacking Judah, and Judah was dreading Israel. He will reunite them as his children together again, and they will together fight their enemies and conquer them. Those who, who walk with God, we may be of different backgrounds, different genders, different socioeconomic status, different you know races. I, I love I love that when I see in our church here at Holy Cross, like all kinds of different people, different walks of life, you know, young and old, and men and women, and and different nationalities and different genders and different everything, but we're all one. We're all one family, and we're all hopefully, hopefully are united in one accord against a common enemy and towards a common goal. Um, that's all I have here for this, uh, for this chapter. Um, chapter 12 is very, very brief, but I didn't prepare for it yet, so I'm not going to start it right now. So, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything about this chapter 11? Okay. While you're looking through your notes or whatnot, let's look together and tell me something that you noticed or something that you learned that you're going to try to remember to apply in your life from this chapter. Have you come across anything? That the earth is limited and we should enjoy it while we can. 
Okay. Um, the earth is limited and we enjoy it while we can. Oh, that everything that we see. So sure, I mean, God's creation is for us and we do need to appreciate it and enjoy it by all means. It's not wrong to enjoy it. But at the same time, Andrew, we don't want to put our, our reliance in it because it is limited. The, the day will come where all the stuff will be gone away. We want to focus more on things that are not visible or seen. Thank you. I would say the change in the nature of the human, human slash animal behavior that you can get the ox and the lion sitting together or the lion eating grass. There's something going to change. And uh, hopefully that change in nature we can, I can experience before we leave this place uh, so that we can surrender our life. So he can change it the way he like it to be. It's, um, it is definitely good news to see how God will restore everything to how it was originally. Um, we don't have to wonder how life was like <clears throat> with Adam and Eve and all the, the creatures and stuff before the fall. Um, we will get to see that if we keep walking with God. But I think, yeah, I mean, the thing that, uh, that, like you said, Dr. Philippe, you know, that, that gives really a lot of encouragement is that the torment, this continuous fight between my flesh and my spirit, I can increase little by little as I walk with God in them becoming friends and being aligned in God's will. Thank you. Um, I just really like how a lot in the Bible, um, a lot of things are taught to us by examples like from nature and animals. And it's just a nice reminder like of how much you can learn just from just quiet, peaceful time, just outside in nature, just surrounded by the trees and the birds and the animals and just observing and so much is happening. And it's so it's just refreshing and calming. The Bible tells us all creation testifies and God's truths are embedded in everything around us. If we just watch and observe and we're paying attention, we will see God's truths in everything around us. That's true. That's why he would often go to a quiet place in nature or he would take his disciples with him to say, come, let's go to a quiet, secluded place in nature by yourself. Um, we need to do that life right now. It's going like 100 knots an hour. Anybody else? Yes, I want to uh, find uh, rest in us. Uh, this also means that everybody, those who are fighting, everybody wants to, to devour his neighbor or do bad things like the wolf or the the, the beast of the wilderness, when he come and rest in our heart, hearts, everybody will, will try to please God. He will, he will forget about his selfishness and rudeness and try to be, yani, to give up all these bad habits and to the love and peace will appear on everyone. Uh, I don't know when, but I hope the whole world will be yani. A time will come when they are all in peace. There is a, um, a general theme here of rest where it kept popping up in this chapter, and it all begins with the spirit of the Lord resting. When I, when I accept uh, Christ's message and the good news and salvation, and I am baptized, and if I, when I believe and I'm baptized, and then I... I live my life according to his will. Then his, his spirit is able to rest in me. And this causes rest within me, like between me and my flesh. And rest within, um, uh, in spite of all the turmoil and the stuff happening around in the world. And rest between me and those who are different from me. 
different races or genders or age or socioeconomic status and rest in the sense of the the partnership or the oneness with other believers where we are all in one accord just a whole a big theme of rest and stillness and peace who comes One thing I will say also that I've, I've noticed is, is again that God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. And I need to um, be wise enough and humble enough and honest enough to not um, deceive myself with how I look or appear on the outside. And I need to look at inside and my heart, my thought, my emotions, my feelings, my interpretations and my perceptions. These are the things that we need to focus on. Just like the, 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 the seven spirit attributes of the spirit of God about how, you know, the spirit of wisdom and understanding of counsel and might and knowledge and uh, the fear of the Lord. We need to watch for that, aspire to increase and grow in that and to ask God to help us with those things, seeking first the kingdom of God, if you will. All righty. Um, I'm sorry. Else? Yeah, go I, ahead, I, I, Michael. Yeah, uh, going back to the rest, um, I think if we keep it in mind, the context of what Isaiah is writing here, the message that he's sending and the circumstances that he's in, he's still able to speak about rest and joy. And we can't wait for our environment to change around us, our external circumstances to change around us for us to find rest and joy um, that is something that only uh, God can provide for us um, if we wish to plug into him um, so regardless of like today's environment you can find rest and joy uh, regardless I heard uh, thank you I, I heard um, someone say it's like happiness has to do with what is happening around you. Um, what's funny is that, I mean, we're all living in the same world and we're all, you know, life has its ups and downs for all of us, um, for some of us more than others and for some of us less than others. But really we're all, we're all under the same, we're all in the same prison. We're all in the same realm of the enemy. And, what really makes the difference or differentiates a person from another is how they respond to their environment. It's not that their environment is different, it's how they respond to their environment. And, and those who walk with God, like Michael is saying, really can have this unshakable rest no matter what circumstances they're at. Uh, and not only have the rest for themselves, but they exude that rest and they are able to bring rest and peace to wherever wherever they go and 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 actually the ultimate result is that people see that rest in them and they ask them for the reason of that rest and like see saint peter tells us to be ready always in season not a season to give them the reason and how do you find that rest like the samaritan woman when she was talking with jesus and said oh please give me that water tell me that water that whoever drinks will never thirst again i want that rest that once we have it, it can only increase and um, I won't be thirsty again. All right. Um, let's go ahead and stop in here um, and we'll resume, God willing, uh, next Thursday with uh, chapter 12, more, most likely chapter 12 and uh, we'll hit 13 as well. Um, let's see if somebody can pray for us. Mina, Mina Nachla, do you want to pray for us? I will try. I want to miss my internet connection is a bit. It might cut out. If um, we lose you, we'll uh, we'll switch to somebody else. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Thank you, God, for giving us uh, this time together to learn about how much 
comfort you give us and even the difficult things that we might be go, going through is in the end just for maybe our comfort and bringing us closer to you and how in our lives we can we are able to attain that peacefulness that we can't find anywhere else and that surpasses all of our uh, understanding just by aligning ourselves with you and you've given us all of the ways to do that. Uh, thank you for that and for blessing us and for keeping us now in this time. Uh, in your name we pray, I mean. Amen. Through the intercessions of me and all these things, it's so easy from the beginning. <clears throat> the mighty power of the Lord gave cross. Peace, the Lord, make us worthy to pray. Thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us stay our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Is Jesus our Lord? For thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is only God, Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. The communion, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you will be all go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you guys so much. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Salam, My pleasure.